not only have a wonderful speaker, but also a wonderful sponsor, uh, Admiral, retired Admiral Kurt Tidd, who is a supporting member at the museum and helps us out with a lot of things. So thank you, Kurt. And thank you for introducing us to Martha Herb. She is a retired Rear Admiral. And uh, we're honored to listen and hear about what it's like to come up into the Navy as a, a female and a female diver and some of the breakthroughs and some of the things that you've helped future um, members of the service, as male and female divers and uh, what they'll be able to accomplish moving forward. So thank you. Um, thank you, Martha, and we give you the floor. Okay. So it's great to be here. Uh, I'm going to start and say congratulations to uh, Kurt Tidd and his daughter. They graduated today. I'm dying Ooh. to know if y'all la laughed at President Biden's joke. We were rocking. It was, uh, <laughs> of course, Jackie said, okay, I'm going back on Air Force One. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let me um, pull up my, um, if I can get uh, the... Share screen up. Should be good to go. Okay, so everybody can see that? All right, yep. so this is Celebrating Female Navy Divers and it's a story about the strength of the human spirit and the four mindsets of excellence. So if you have your cell phones with you, so it'd be great, everybody who has their cell phone, if you'll get it out and go to a website www.menti.com. And once you get to that website, you plug in the code 59343059. So this is the infamous icebreaker. And the question that you're going to answer is on a scale of one to 10, where one is the least and 10 is the worst you can imagine, what is your level of Zoom fatigue? Now, when you answer this question, it's going to show up on the screen as you vote. So once again, if you'll get your cell phone out and if you need to run, get it, go run, get it. And you go to menti.com and it's gonna come up into my presentation. And then you plug in that code at the top and then you're gonna evaluate whether your Zoom fatigue is one to three four to seven or eight to 10. And then once you put it in, you hit enter and it should show up on the screen. Hmm. So is, are people voting? Um, I've got one foot one. Sarah said I entered, but I'm not seeing my screen register my vote. And I think that's what's happening to me too. It says, okay. please wait for a presenter to show the next slide. Okay. Well, then they're waiting <laughs> on me. Let's see. Nope. Okay. <laughs> oh, there we go. There, there we go. So most of the people on here are between a one and a three. Some people are at a four to seven. And we have two people who are exhausted and, and just over the top. So as you'll see, we're going to do this throughout the presentation just to kind of keep you a little bit involved um, and make it a little interesting. So deep sea diving stories are like fish tales. They're, they get better with time often humorous, mostly stories of perseverance, determination, and a hoo attitude. Sometimes they are amazing stories of heroism. Tonight, I have a question for you. Do you believe in the strength of the human spirit to excel in the face of adversity? So I really want you to think about that question. Do you believe in the strength of the human spirit to excel in the face of adversity? Here's my story. Growing up, I loved the water. I remember sitting on the front porch waiting for my dad to come home from work. He would pull in the driveway, I'd jump in the car and we'd go to swim practice. 
Swimming became my passion and I worked out 22 hours a week. I learned that deliberate practice day in and day out produced the mindsets of excellence. I practiced and practiced and produced all in as a mindset, never, never, never give up, live in the moment and dare to challenge your own limitations. With years of swimming, I learned how to be comfortable in the uncomfortable when times get tough and times do get tough. I grew up on the TV show, Sea Hunt with Lloyd Bridges and his diving adventures with Zale Perry. They showed the underwater world at its best with a great, what a great job to be in the water and get paid. And just for everybody's information, that's my wonderful husband and myself with Zale Perry. At 24 and the prompting of my mom, I visited the Navy recruiter. It was a chief and he told me about all the advantages in the Navy. He wasn't very convincing, so I was out the door. About three weeks later, Lieutenant Bill Sullivan gave me a call and invited me back to his office. I went in his office and I noticed a magazine rack in that office and on it was a picture of a Navy diver. And he had a face mask on and scuba tanks. And I looked at that, it was just like Sea Hun. And I said, I wanna do that. Um, and so Lieutenant Sullivan said, okay, if you can get through dive school, you can do that. And that's the sum total of what I knew about Navy diving. As a matter of fact, I knew extraordinarily little about the Navy, except that my dad served in the Merchant Marines. You can imagine the look on his face when I went home and said, hey, dad, I joined the Navy and I'm gonna be a deep sea diving and salvage officer. He thought it was great for his three sons to be in the military, but his daughter, in 1942, the Navy began making some sweeping changes to policies. Rates other than mess men were opened up for African-Americans. In 1944, the Golden 13 became commissioned officers. In 1954, Carl Brashears became the first African-American second-class diver. And by the 1970s, women began knocking on the dive school door. My dive class was in Washington, D.C. from November to May, a winter class, 21 men and two women led by a band of male instructors who looked at the two women as the weakest links, go figure. On day two of school, the class took the time PT test, push-ups, sit-ups, pull-ups, mile and a half run, 500 yard swim, the instructor seemed genuinely surprised when I knocked out the required pull-ups. I didn't need the easier standard they developed for women. Then we went on a three mile run through the streets of DC to the pool for the swim part of the test. One of the instructors shouts out, anybody wanna race in a 53? Eh, they didn't know my background. My classmates stared and shook their heads as I raised my hand and then they watched. I beat the instructor, it wasn't even close. As for the instructor, you can imagine his face. And then his hoo band of brothers added fuel to the fire by taunting him with beat by the girl. Another one of the instructors, Chief Youngblood, decided that I should pay. He leans into my face, so I bet you a case of beer you don't last a week in this school and I'll make sure you don't. I stood there, put my hands on my hips and said, I'll take that bed. Chief Youngblood made it his personal mission to make sure I failed. Harassment was his specialty and he prided himself in making me suffer. He forgot about the strength of the human spirit. Maybe he didn't. Back in those days, we didn't have safe places or training timeouts. The only option, succeed. For a solid week, Chief was in my face. We did countless sets of push-ups, eight count bodybuilders, flutter kicks, and hello darlings. My hamstrings were as tight as rubber bands. We ran for miles and miles. By the end of the week, 
The class was on another run to the pool and Chief Youngblood is yelling at me again, asking his favorite question. Ensign, you wanna quit? At this point, I was hungry, angry, and tired. And that's a lethal combination. I yelled back, no, I don't wanna quit, so shut up and leave me alone. Classmates shook their heads and went in the pool area, wondering if I'd be kicked out of school. Ah, I was just an ensign. I stayed outside with Chief Youngblood to do penalty eight count bodybuilders and listen to his long lecture on respecting my instructors. This was the first of many Navy lessons I learned from a chief. That afternoon, Chief Youngblood gave me the case of beer and said with a smirk, I just wanted to see if you really wanted to be here. He finally started treating me like a future Navy diver instead of a wannabe. Even though he was a pain in my neck, he helped me cement in my own mind that I wanted to succeed. He drove me to excellence and I thank him to this day. 23 weeks of dive school meant no time for hair, makeup or caring about your looks. The truth is, it wasn't about being a female. It was about being included in the Hu Ya Navy dive team. I didn't realize that I was asking to join a close-knit fraternity where 99% of the world's population wouldn't have a chance of getting in, much less a woman. Challenging journeys require a sense of humor to be humble enough to laugh at yourself and your own mistakes, and then do something about it. Scuba week during dive school was one of those journeys. This video clip that I'm getting ready to play is from the school in Panama City, and it provides you a snapshot of scuba problem solving Navy style. Now, this is from a class that just graduated about six, eight months ago. So the music is very in keeping with the younger generation, but I hope you enjoy the video. Damn! Damn! Listen 
chips. Stop. Win, 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 win. Yeah. You clowns really don't stand outside when I play outside. I put the beats on them like drought side. I got the bow side and that loud side. And if you act bad, I bring the cow side. Go and get your money, bitch. None of my hitters on some funny shit. I can tell real by who you're running with. I'm all in the field. Duck hunt. Shh. Hit my plug just to read up. That knows somebody that knows something about it. And I won't answer now. Who, what, where, where, why? See, a lot of dudes like to act the fool and I'll get on live, but that ain't my style. Now, who he gonna get and what he gonna do? Run up on me if you want to. Hot damn pressing his homies. He's done up in front of his mama. I'll mop up the floor with him. And I keep in the door and let the phone go get him. I got food that'll go get him. This for him and the fool and them dudes that threaten him. As all divers will say, when I went through school, it was a whole lot harder than that. Um, but bitter cold winter days and ice on the river in Washington, D.C. highlighted my dive school and diving Mark V, a 190 pound diving rig of leather and lead with surface supplied air and communications. Early one morning, my job was to back out 100 yards across the bottom of the river to the class project, which was fouled by some sort of river debris. I was to shackle a line around the debris, let Topside know when I was done, and they would haul it up. Visibility in the Anacostia River is zero. Sitting on the bench, ready to go, they button me up. Two taps on the helmet, and I'm up doing the Mark V shuffle to the ladder, while the instructors are yelling, make that dress look good. The weight of the rig is digging into my collarbones. Once in the water, Mark V is a really sweet dive rig, but the ones at dive school leaked like a sieve, which made every dive cold and wet. I'm on the bottom, sinking in the mud, and topside goes, okay, Red, and then get to work. I'm freezing cold, it's dark, so I add some air to the dress and I hover on the bottom and start striding along the bottom to the project with the line and shackle in hand. In the darkness, my hands are my eyes. I put the line around the debris, but I can't get the shackle pin in all the way. Topside calls out, Red Diver, are you shackled in yet? Time's up, secure the project, square yourself away, return to the barge. I'm unsure if the shackle and line will hold. It was a timed project that you either passed or fail failed. Failure meant you got kicked out of school and had to go back to the fleet. Rolling back in the last great class in Washington, DC wasn't an option. So I did what I knew best. I timed five of the ugliest granny knots you have ever seen. And then I tied a few more to make sure they held. Once on the bench, Topside starts hauling in the project. I wait with bated breath. The instructors look at the large limb and then the line and all the granny knots and the shackle 
And then they started howling with laughter at my stupidity because the shackle pin was in backwards. My greatest hoo moment during one particular dive day was with Chief Welsh and Chief Youngblood who asked random questions about Mark V. What's the size of the nut? What's the diameter? How do you do this? How do you do that? If a student answered wrong, it cost 25 eight count bodybuilders. They kept a running tally so students could pay their marker at the end of the day. By day's end, I owed 225 eight count bodybuilders. Of course, even back then, it was against the rules to make any student do 225 of anything. So I would count to 25, stop, yell out 25, and then I'd do 25 more and yell out 50. Nine sets of 25 eight count bodybuilders. Frankly, I thought it was funny. I just steeled my mind and stayed comfortable in the uncomfortable. In May, 1980, our class, the last great class graduated from the school in Washington, DC. Many of the Navy diving greats attended that graduation and honored closing of the dive school, celebrating the end of its diving traditions and the great stories of breaking ice and diving Mark V. The special operations community consisted of three specialty areas, diving and salvage, explosive ordnance, and ordnance management. Officers were expected to specialize in two of three areas. During the 70s, seven women had proved their mettle with two doing scuba qualifications. So if you look um, up here, you'll see Katie Garner, Gardner is the first girl who qualified in scuba. And then Linda Hubble became the first officer to qualify in scuba. Then in 76, Donna Tobias completed second class dive school. And then in 77, Mary Bonin completed dive school. And she went on to become the first female master diver. And I believe she retired as a warrant officer. Um, and then in the mixed gas diving and salvage, you had Sue Truckin in the graduated in March of 1980. And then I graduated I, uh, with Darlene Iskra in, in May of 1980. And Darlene Iskra became the first woman CEO of a ship. So a lot of great things happened for the women who proved themselves in the 70s. My first diving assignment was in San Diego, California. Guess what job I was assigned? You bet, admin duties. But it only made sense because I was the only one who could type. I finally convinced the master diver and one of the chiefs to take me on some dives. Senior Chief Walker um, let me use one of his old wetsuits. Here I was again, cold and miserable, trying to prove myself to another group of Navy divers who seemed to wonder how I got into their fraternity. The uniform of the day on the dive boat, UDT shorts, blue and golds and jungle boots. I loved it. A far cry from the uniform of the day. Shipboard sailors looked enviously at us as we went around the harbor and on the dive boat. Our dives dealt mostly with underwater ship's husbandry, fixing the ship below the waterline. Jobs ranged from working on screws to hull inspections, installing patches and plugs and cleaning sonar domes. We did it all, and frankly, it was cheaper than dry docking a ship. I learned very quickly that divers had firsthand views of the ship's seamanship problems. I can remember sitting with the CEO of a ship and telling him, it looks like you ran over something, your screws damaged. The underwater photos never lied. On occasion, we'd take the dive boat to our favorite 90 foot shelf just outside of San Diego Harbor for proficiency dives to deeper depths and to get a little abalone. We traveled to Long Beach Harbor for some jobs and scraping scallops off pilings. Diving was a great way to spend your Navy day. Master Diver Kilberry and Senior Chief Walker made time to teach me the ins and outs of ship husbandry. They taught me to know the Navy fleet better than anybody 
from the water line and below. Contrast that for a moment with the OIC who would say things like, I could chase her around the desk when she wears her salt and peppers. Ugh. As a matter of fact, I saw the world through a face mask. Diving took me all over the world from the Atlantic to the Pacific and Indian Oceans to the Florida Keys, Gulf of Mexico, the Mediterranean, the Caribbean, the Philippines and Hong Kong Harbor. I participated in dive operations with National Park Service, a diving film production with the BBC, ice diving with Canadian divers, military exercises with international dive teams, and a few Hobby Lob trips to capture some of the great eats from the ocean's depths. We completed dive operations on a German U-boat in the Potomac River, surveys on the Arizona and Utah and Hawaii, a Civil War wreck in Virginia, and a wreck near Loggerhead Key. The ocean depths are full of surprises, but most of y'all know that. It's remarkably peaceful and the colors are beautiful. There is so much we don't know. Since most of my diving was harbor diving, I relish those dives in clear, warm water. Because if you haven't figured it out, I hate cold water. And the keys are gorgeous. There, one time during a night dive off Loggerhead Key, I accidentally stabbed my index finger on a sea urchin. The diving dock treated it with what was available, a sterilized pocket knife and some antiseptic. Two weeks later, my finger and hand stiffened. Oral antibiotics failed. They tried IV antibiotics, they failed. So the doctor decided on some exploratory surgery. 54 stitches later, he eradicated a green scaly substance from my tendon and my palm. Apparently, my hand provided the perfect growing environment for whatever this thing was. My nurse, who happened to be a Navy diver, fondly nicknamed me the sea urchin lady. But here's the thing, whether it's my dive stories or those of my sea sisters, we can all say that earning the right to be called a Navy diver is something unique. The adventure instilled in all of us confidence, an attitude, if I can do this, I can do anything. The Navy's opportunities exceeded my wildest dreams. I only had to say yes and then be all in. During all those years, I changed from that ensign out for the adventure and developed into a true Naval officer and patriot. I believed in the strength of the human spirit and the importance of leadership, courage, and resilience. Our force was filled with people who served with ingenuity and dedication. We all gave some and wore the cloth of our nation with a pride and a unique awareness that few serve. For 39 years, I watched Navy policy become more inclusive. And I knew from personal experience that individual people change far more slowly than the policies they make. Policies are just ideals, but it takes real leadership, real people, and everybody having the freedom to reach for anything they choose. And only then do policies become a reality. And now I'm back to that original question. Do you believe in the strength of the human spirit to excel in the face of adversity. So if you can go back to your phone and do your vote. And hopefully while y'all are seeing this, this is you know from a website, a website called mentimeter.com. And it's just a fun way to add interactive um, items into your conversation. Okay, so we, we'll stop there. We have 14 votes, nobody voted no. We have four people who five people, so people are still voting. 
um, that say sometimes. So while we look at this, I want you to consider four mindsets, the four key mindsets. My studies, so I have a doctorate in education and I specialize in counseling. Um, my studies in brain science tell me that our minds often determine victory or defeat. Just like the scuba divers in that video, they had to learn how to relax while they were getting the hits from the instructors and not panic so that they could be successful. So your mind determines victory or defeat. You never will know your own limitations until you test them again and again and again. So I'm gonna propose these four mindsets. I'm gonna give you a definition and then we're gonna, I'm gonna have a question for you. So the mindset of all in, when you choose to do something, you have to be all in. All in is a deliberate choice to give fearless commitment to the journey, despite naysayers who tell you you won't make it. It's about giving your best always to achieve victory and excellence. The second one, never, never, never quit. No whining, no excuses, no options. You have to steel your mind against the emotions that encourage you to quit. Take the easy way out. When tough times come, and they do, you have to silence the negative voices in your head. It's like there's a little angel on one side, on the left side, which is negative, and there's one on the right side, which is positive. And whichever one you feed gets louder and louder, and it controls your attitude and your performance, which then influences the outcome of victory or defeat. Mindset three. Live in the moment. To keep moving forward on your road to success, you must teach your mind to seize the moment. Quit worrying about the next step or the next five steps or the next day. Stay focused on the small incremental steps required to achieve your goal. If you approach every goal as an opportunity, and this is what nobody likes, for relentless hard work, you multiply your ability to be comfortable in the uncomfortable. And mindset four, always challenge your own limitations without fear. Recognize the strength that God instills in everybody, the strength of courage and courage of the human spirit to pursue excellence in the face of adversity. Never lose sight of your ability to achieve anything that you put your mind to. It's about prayer and the rule of thirds. A third of the time, you're supposed to feel good. A third of the time, okay. And a third of the time, you're supposed to feel crummy. If you're feeling crummy all the time, progress is impossible. And if you're feeling good all the time, you aren't working hard enough. So now I'd like you to go back to your voting. So, the question is, which mindset, if, if this is true, um, I'm asking you, assuming that this is true, which mindset is most important to you or which mindset have you noticed you've used most often in your life? Or if you're a diver, which mindset have you had to rely on when things weren't going so well? So go ahead and vote. This is fascinating how it changes in, in real time. <laughs> yeah, and that's what makes it fun. And, you know, you can incorporate um, so many questions and make it totally interactive. You can collect information on your organization while you're doing it. Um, and it's just a great way to do presentations if you're going to do them on Zoom. So most people are going after being all in. Um, and then as you can see, second is dare to challenge your own limitations. 
Third is to never give up. And fourth is living the moment. Living in the moment is a hard thing to do because most of us, it's, it's not our natural. Thank you for voting. So as I'm getting ready to wrap up, on Memorial Day, which is this month of May, we honor those who gave their all. Remember, I started with some dive tales are amazing stories of her heroism. This is when those mindsets are really tested. Frankly, diving is dangerous. There's no place for complacency. Navy divers are taught to be professionals and to stay laser focused when it's time to go to work. We put our lives in the hands of our deep sea brothers and sisters with every dive, trusting they will bring us home. In 1945 at Pearl Harbor, two Navy divers became trapped while tunneling under an LST that sunk in 40 feet of water and 20 feet of mud. Navy diver Owen Hammerberg embraced his role as rescue diver in spite of the risk, additional cave-ins, fouling his own lifeline on jagged pieces of metal, or just failing. Washing a passage through the original ex excavation points, Hammerberg reached the first trapped diver. He worked desperately in pitch black darkness and finally freed the trapped diver's fouled lifeline thereby enabling him to reach the surface. Exhausted but still determined, Hammerberg pressed onward through oozing mud to the second diver. Venturing still further under the buried hulk, Hammerberg reached a place immediately above the second diver and wham, another cave in. A heavy piece of steel pinned Hammerberg crosswise over his shipmate in such a way that he protected the trap diver from further injury. Hammerberg bore the full brunt of the cave-in. They were both recovered. The second diver lived. As for Hammerberg, 18 hours after he had gone to the aid of his fellow divers, he died. He gave his all to save his shipmates and ultimately was awarded the Medal of Honor. All gave some, some gave all. Let's remember those who gave their all. They left behind moms and dads, brothers, sisters, wives, and children who always have that dark place in their deepest soul where their loved one's memories are stored. They never forget, and we shouldn't either. If you know a Gold Star family, send them a card. Honor their loved one by taking the time to honor them. It's been a pleasure. Hopefully it was interesting, informative, and I guess we'll open it up for questions. Oh, that was absolutely fantastic. I'm going to go back to the group view to do questions. Do, do, do. All right, there we are. Okay, so if anyone's got questions, I have a couple that came in. You can send them to me in the chat. Let us see. Well, Kurt, of course, wanted to know when you, uh, you and your husband are coming down to the Keys to go diving because you're invited, so. <laughs> wait, we can't wait. We might have to go one at a time. Oh, but... wait, he just came. He wasn't even here for me to answer, ask that question. He just came in. <laughs> Kurt, I just asked your question. She said she'll come visit you. <laughs> <laughs> I've been bugging you for two years now, so it's time to get off the dime. Yeah, I know. I'm going to have to leave Mike here with his mom, and I'll come alone. <laughs> okay. Hey, anytime, anytime that works uh, for you or for both of you together, up to you. But, uh, okay. but looking forward to getting you down here because it is warm, and the water's getting warmer, and it's the and it's it's great visibility, and it's the kind of diving you'll love. Yeah, I prefer that. I appreciate the hospitality. Okay. <laughs> um, all right, I've got another one. Um, of your time in service, how many years were spent diving? So I dove for 17 years um, and then I ended up at the cardiologist and because I went into AFib um, and they did an echocardiogram and discovered I had a PFO, which is an opening between wow. the left and right atria. 
And so the doctor said, this predisposes you to getting bent. You're very lucky that you never got bent over 17 years. Um, and so that was the, I didn't die for a while until they did some heart surgery and fixed it. Plus, as you get more senior, you just, you know, you don't get any more diving commands mm-hmm. They make you work. <laughs> Excellent. Um, also, so when you were in diving school, how you talked about it being cold and you were doing it during the winter months. How cold was that? Cause I'm sure some of us haven't dove in cold water before. <laughs> so um, in the winter, it's about 30 degrees, the water, but then you have the air temperature. So you're, t- you're doing diving tending, you're getting wet while you're tending the diver, dressing the Mark five diver and it's five below zero. So it's almost worse being the tender because now you've got a uniform on, you've got all the stuff on to stay warm, but you're wet. And then you're spinning nuts. And so your hands get so cold, they start cutting and cracking and bleeding and it's not pretty. <laughs> oh, doesn't sound like it. Um, Warren was wondering, did you ever get to meet Carl Brashear? So he came to our graduation um, because we were the last great class in Washington, D.C. And so we all got to meet him there. And, you know, he's just an incredible a master diver what he did after he lost his leg and then to kind of go through the ritual and go through all that stuff again and prove that he could lift mixed gas mark five with one leg that's incredible yeah because no, mixed is. gas mark five is 300 pounds no definitely um teresa was wondering would you tell us a little bit more about your career after diving so um i i had a great career i did active duty And then my husband and I took a vote as to who could have the children and I won. I was best equipped. So I went in the reserves and he stayed on active duty. And then I went all the way up to captain doing diving jobs. Um, And then I started doing international relations. So more um, things with NATO. I worked with NATO for seven years um, doing crisis management exercises. Then I um, got to get an army uniform and a gun and I went to Afghanistan. Um, And then I worked with CNP and the CNO uh, doing sexual assault prevention, suicide prevention. And then I ended back up working internationally with the Western hemisphere, running an international school for a master's degree in security and defense. Oh, wow. So, you know, it just, you kind of, it goes back to those mindsets. It's like, okay, here's what we want you to try now. And you got to be agile and adaptable and be willing to try it and then give your all. Mm -hmm. You have to deal with the failure when you first start, but if you can get past that, you can succeed. Right. Right. Oh, that's awesome. And then how would you say that kind of building off of that, that diving led you more to deal with a lot of like that the mentality work and everything and doing the therapy and all that kind of stuff. Like, would you say like, did diving kind of having to work with your own mind over all those years and stuff, did that want to, you know, kind of put you on the path to work with others and not necessarily in a diving sense? So I always wanted to be a psychiatrist actually. Um, (laughs) And the organic chemistry was too hard. So that, you know, I ended up um, in the Navy uh, doing diving. Um, I just like people. Mm -hmm. Um, And it wasn't until I started going into the counseling that I began to understand more of the harassment that you see in the scuba diving. You know, you watch it, you go, why are you treating people like that? But then you realize what you're teaching their mind to be able to do, and it keeps them safe and their fellow divers safe if they can stay calm when it's hard. No, oh, that that definitely that definitely makes a lot of sense. Um, obviously, you were referring to your class is the 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 last grade class. Have there not been any classes with female as many female divers as there were back then? So. We call ourselves the last great class because we were the last one in Washington, D.C. Okay. And 
you know, as we say, you know, all those people who go through Panama City, they're wimps because <laughs> the water's clear. It's mostly warm. They have a beautiful swimming pool. You know, they got it easy, but yeah. you know, that's folklore. Um, and, but for the women, because the community changed from special operations to EOD, most of the women going through now are EOD and they do some diving. So it's a little bit different on the officer side than the enlisted side. I called um, Rebecca uh, and Be Becky Jones and said, hey, how many women have gone through dive school since 1972? And neither of us have a count. And I kind of wonder if we're up at 100 yet. Oh, so wow. she said, in terms of the diving, a lot of enlisted women have been going through and a lot of diving corpsmen women have been going through. Okay. But it's still a very unique elite population of women who have the athletic abilities to do that kind of stuff. No, that, I, I would imagine that that exactly would be the case. And when, when obviously they were doing that intense training with like the scuba gear, you didn't have to do any kind of like training with the whole, like that with the hard hats and stuff, did you? Or is it different? It's different in, in the hard hats and Mark V, we would have projects that we would have to do. And so you would go down and you'd have to put like a square together and demonstrate, you know, the ability to use the gloves are like this, yeah. <laughs> you know, so you, you, you learn some new textures um, and then you just had to show confidence in the rig. Um, and then you, we do some things in the pressure pot when we do 300 pounds, they'd press us down to depth there. And just to see if you could manage, you know, with being knocked out on right. air, which is great fun. It's the greatest <laughs> thing in the world. <laughs> and no one encourage over. that. <laughs> Uh, also, Kurt just said, uh, you're being too humble to explain how you ran a really tough school full of very proud Latin military <laughs> leaders and that you earned their respect and challenged the way they evalu evaluated the enormous value of women in their military forces. Well, thank you. <laughs> Um, it's, you know, it, it goes to, I was in Afghanistan and the ambassador's wife said, cultural change takes a hundred years. And so you look at my story and that's 40 years. Yeah. And then you say, how many Navy diver women are there right now? You know, and I think at any given time, it hovers at about 25 or 30. Mm -hmm. so, so, you know, this cultural change takes a long time. And right. You have to learn how to be patient. The ambassador wife was from China. Mm -hmm. And so she was saying that based on what she saw women going through in China. Right. No, that's that's an interesting perspective on that. Um, I've got another one. When did the Navy phase out the Mark V? Oh, they phased it out. No, just kidding. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so when I was in going through dive school, they brought in the Mark 12, which disappeared quickly and went to Mark 21. Um, I don't think any classes, I don't know whether any classes dove it in Panama City, maybe the first one in 1980, but I don't think so. Okay. Um, it just, you know, nobody dives it anymore. So you really, it's really a fun rig to dive. Mm -hmm. And I know we've, Lisa, you've participated in, getting to wear the Mark V at like little vintage dive events and stuff. Right. And actually the one that I did in Vortex Springs, we had the Navy, the current being trained Navy divers come dive the Mark V in Vortex Springs because they wanted to have that hi historical current kind of comparison. Yeah. And um, they really wanted to talk the officers into bringing it back so that they could have that training in the pool. Um, just, just to know what the, you know, what, where they came from and where they're at now. Yeah. It, it's such a nostalgia thing. And, yeah. you know, it's just great to talk about. And then you look at the movies and you see John Wayne in it and that's really cool. Yeah. No, definitely. Definitely. And this, I actually just have this kind of a weird question. What, what is the, a count, the, the body thing you had to do the workout what what kind of, what is it you don't have to demonstrate 
Well, I can't get my camera to do that. No. <laughs> so, so you start standing up, you go down into a knee bend with your hands on the ground. You thrust your feet backwards. You do okay. a push up and then your feet separate and come back together. And then you jump them back in and stand back up. Okay. So it's oh. like a, it's like a burpee, but with the leg expansion. Right. It, okay. It, it, it adds that in. So it's a bunch of them and you have great <laughs> core muscles after you do that. <laughs> I'll start adding that to my workout. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, do I have any, oh, actually Dr. Sally just said the Navy stopped teaching it after 1980. Thank you, Dr. Sally. <laughs> um, do I have any other questions from anyone else? I'll give you a minute to pop them into the chat. So while we're waiting for that, um, Martha, we would like to thank you for being our presenter. And as a Immerse Yourself uh, presenter, you we give you a one-year membership to the History cool. of Diving Museum. So you can come visit the History of thank Diving you. Museum 362 days a year uh, and bring your friends at a discount. You get to shop in the store at a discount. And um, we appreciate you. I, I wanted to, I graduated in 1978 from high school and I wanted to go into the Navy and be a diver. And I guess it, it was so new or so restricted. Yeah. They said, oh no, women, women aren't allowed on boats and women don't dive. Yeah. So I went on to become a scuba instructor, but you know, hearing you were like those couple of years ahead of me and um, had a lot more tenacity <laughs> to not listen to them and keep moving. Well, I was so very lucky. You. I was very lucky with Lieutenant Bill Sullivan, who later became Vice Admiral Sullivan. And I actually ended up working for him in NATO. And he remembered me and I didn't remember him. Oh, but, wow. you know, kudos to him. I want to say one thing. So I see on here, John and Anita Stockton. <laughs> so, and what's really cool about them is uh, their son was one of our sponsor kids at the Naval Academy. And he eventually went to dive school to become a DMO. Nice. So Very cool. It's a small family. I believe it. All right, let's see if I've got anyone else. I think we are all good on that. So I suppose we will. Okay, you know, thank you very much. Wrapping. This was wonderful, Martha. Thank you so much, even in the middle of all our back and forth over the past couple of months and everything. We made it work. And, you know, this was a fantastic presentation. And I'm, I'm oh, looking forward to much. sharing it. Thank no, you very much. Great. Well, thank, thank you, you for coming and we will Hi, see John you. and Nita. <laughs> Bye, guys. Bye. All right. I'm going to go ahead and leave too. See you later. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.